Hello, morning Gita. Good morning. Morning Ivana. So uh, today's uh, webinar is about um, uh, being too famous may not be a good thing for trademark. And we have here uh, the director uh, of Trademarks and Design Division at uh, uh, CAS International. Uh, she is uh, Miss Gita. <laughs> so, <laughs> so without further ado, I think we I better pass the floor to Gita and start uh, her webinar today on being too famous may not be a good thing for trademark. Let's put our hands together to welcome Miss Gita. Yay. Okay, you can start already. Thank okay. you, Ivana. Okay. Can I see you? Ah, can. Good. Okay, so let me change it to my slides. Thanks a lot, Ivana, for the introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, for uh, and thank you for tuning in to this webinar. Uh, as Ivana said, my name is Gita and I have 13 years of experience in intellectual property uh, and especially with trademarks and designs. So a bit about a company, because who are you listening to and why should you even listen to us? Uh, so CAS has been around for 19 years and we have offices in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia and Myanmar. Uh, and we are very much specialized in everything and anything to do with intellectual property. This is what we do. So we protect rights concerned with intellectual creations, be it brands or designs or technology, anything that someone creates with their intellectual mind, if it's reduced to substance, we can protect it. And we will advise on how to protect it locally and abroad. Then we talk about utilizing the IP rights either through licensing, joint licensing, valuation of the rights if you want to sell the trademarks or the invention, um, joint venture agreements, research agreements, and so on. What if there's disputes as well? Development for human resources in IP issues being IP awareness talks. IP, it's, it's really important in the economy these days, but a lot of people are not aware of what intellectual property assets they have. So we do a lot of public talks and webinars such as this to increase awareness on intellectual property rights. So a bit about us again, uh, we are known in the industry. We're one of the top IP firms in Malaysia. And that brings us to our talk. Being famous may not be a good thing for trademarks. Um, really excited to give this talk. You will hear about Google, WhatsApp, um, some cases on Coca-Cola. Um, and I really hope that all brand owners will go home today learning about what they should do and what they shouldn't do in terms of the manner they use their trademarks in business. Please feel free to ask as many questions as you can. Uh, being a webinar, we can still make it interactive. You can type in your chat box next to you. Um, and Ivana, our moderator, will eventually um, address these questions at the end of the webinar and we'll do a Q&A session. So please yeah, feel free to raise as many questions because the more you raise questions, the more you will learn what can be applied to your business and others can learn from your questions as well. Before you, you can see that there are some brands, Aspirin, Escalator, Cellotape and Kerosene, which are names that we are familiar with. So were you aware that all of these trademarks were at one point actually owned by people? These were brands. Now we use it so often. We use the word escalator, cello tape, pass me the cello tape. Don't avoid that escalator. Accidents happen in escalator. I have a headache. And kerosene. The way we, it's actually a normal in, in word in the English uh, vocabulary. At one point, these were all trademarked. The person or the company that created these brands had exclusive rights. They could exploit their rights. So exclusive rights means they have they, they are the only people or the only company that can use these rights, these trademark rights, and they can exploit it. So let's explore. What does exploiting rights even mean? So in trademark law, anyone who owns a brand they have the right to manufacture products or services and affix that brand onto the products or services. Well, you can't manufacture services. I mean, right to manufacture products and deliver services using that brand. Right to sell or offer to sell products or services with that brand. Right to distribute. Right to, exp right to license so they can allow other people to use that brand um, for a fee. Right to assign, assign is selling, so you can even sell the brand. Right to give it to your next of kin. So yes, you can even leave it for your next of kin. You can inherit that trademark asset through a will. And right to stop another person from using it. So these are rights given only to the brand owner. 
And you can see it's quite extensive. Uh, it's, it's extensive, it's monopolistic in nature, it's extensive, and exploiting it gives the owner a lot of opportunity in terms of building their business and earning a revenue. So now going back to the brands we talked about earlier, Print, kerosene, and sellotape, and so on. So just to give you a bit of basic background, for those who don't know they were actually brands to begin with, Aspirin is a drug used to relieve minor pain, headaches, and so on. And this was a trademark once owned by Bayer, the large pharmaceutical company. It was extensively so much so that it, it became a generic word. I want to just use, can you pass me an aspirin? So Bayer, because of this, Bayer lost its trademark rights to the brand aspirin in some countries. They still have rights in actually many countries, uh, but in a lot of important jurisdictions, they, they lost rights in France, Russia, Australia, UK, and US. And they still have rights in Germany, Canada, Mexico, and over 80 other countries. But big markets, they lost rights in France and UK. Escalator, which is an always are familiar with, especially in Malaysia when there's so many shopping malls. Um, this, was, this is a trademark that was once owned by the Otis Elevator Company. They are the largest company that develops and manufactures vertical transportation systems. So moving walkways, moving staircases. Uh, and this brand was also lost to them. Now we use it on a daily basis and, and many people don't even know that it was once a brand. Then we have Cellotape. So Cellotape is a European brand um, of transparent cellulose-based adhesive tape. And this was invented in 1937 by two individuals, Colin Kinimont and George Gray, uh, where they coated cellophane film with a natural rubber resin, creating a sticky tape product. So, you know, like in this slide, especially, especially we talk about how it was created. So you will notice about brands that are very famous and these brands, these specific examples are given that lost trademark rights. The product itself are quite new. They, they didn't exist before the owners themselves introduced them to the marketplace. So because of that, it actually is like a cash 22 situation. So if you were, you think about yourself, okay, if you're in business or you always, uh, you are a creative individual or something. And if it's new in a marketplace, what will the public call your product if it doesn't exist at all? So it's the same thing with the sellotape, like the, the slide that you see before you. It's, if sellotape didn't exist before, there were no sticky tapes. What would anyone call it when all they see when, in the packaging and the product name is sellotape? So, so that's actually the Cash22 situation I'm coming to, this product doesn't exist. The person who created it has to name it. You have to name your products, otherwise how do people even refer to products when they want to buy products? But here, it's, it's tricky because it's a first and the brand then becomes the word people use to refer to the product. So we'll talk about how to avoid this uh, in the next, towards the end of the uh, presentation. But this is just for you to understand how this problem even arises in the first place. So back to the escalator. So the art created moving staircases. They didn't exist before this. So it's the cello tape. It wasn't around. So what do the public call it if it's the owners have affixed onto the product? So there are ways to avoid it. And the many ways to avoid it is, is actually making sure that the product, for example, escalator, uh, the, the word that the public use is a moving staircase. It is a mouthful or mo moving walkway. It is a mouthful, but it's very important that the brand that's created, escalator, is not used synonymously with a moving uh, staircase. And back to aspirin as well. So aspirin was one of the earliest pain relief medication. So when it's the first thing out there and, and it's very popular, people, can you pass me an aspirin? So that's the cash 22 situation that all new inventions that are branded then face. Um, uh, brand owners are now a little bit more educated on how to use their brands. Um, and you'll find a lot of trademark guidelines issued by big companies on advising the public how to use their brands. We'll come to that soon as well. So 
uh, kerosene as well is another example, uh, also known as paraffin and lamp oil and coal oil. Uh, it was originally, originally registered as trademark by Abraham Gessner in 1854, but used so extensively as the normal English word that it also lost its trademark rights. So what went wrong? How did trademark owners lose exclusive rights? So it became really famous. So the product was really popular and the product became very famous in the marketplace. They had huge market share and the word was used interchangeably with the way people actually refer to the product. The brand became interchangeable with the name. So becoming very famous very fast is dangerous. If there's no care taken in the way the trademark should be used, care on how the trademark should be used always originates from the owner of the mark. Um, so if it's used in the wrong manner by the public, who are the enforcers? There's no enforcers in the marketplace. Your competitors will be extremely happy. So they are not going to be enforcing anything. You will not be educating the public on how to use your brand properly. If anything, competitors get happy when another brand field of industry becomes generic. Uh, and the reason for this is because they can then grab their product. Think about Velcro. How many of you out there use the word Velcro as a product name, not a When you say, hey, why do you, why do you have a zipper on your, on your dress? Get a Velcro, it's easier. Or on anything, on your tennis racket, when you wrap, up, wrap it up to get, get it, give a better grip, hey, use Velcro, it's better grip. The word Velcro itself, it's of a brand being used in an incorrect manner. It's also very famous. And Velcro also has patents because they are one of the fasteners. So that's the fasteners. It's one of the fasteners that are out there that are affixed in that manner with um, uh, a different type of um, material. So tra when trademarks are used in the wrong manner by the public and they're not controlled by owners, the trademarks then become a generic product name. So that's what went wrong. A good thing, which is your brand being famous, um, destroying your brand value, and the reason being is a lot of efforts were not put in place to make sure the people, everyone that's affected or uses the brand are educated on how to use the brand. So you can actually write on the fact that it's becoming famous, write on the fact that you're getting a bigger, go, go with a wave, but take control of that because otherwise you'll come crashing down. So the marks, um, these, these marks that we're talking about, all the brands that lost brand value and became generic, were used as nouns and verbs and became part of the daily use of the English language. So instead of referring to the product as aspirin pills and kerosene oil, uh, people started referring to the pills as aspirin and oil as kerosene. So they don't put a, the word oil behind kerosene, they don't put the word pills behind aspirin. Salotape, they don't say, Pass me the cello tape, sticky tape, um, so or the cello tape. So these are the kind of um, ways that it actually deteriorates as a noun or in a verb, and not as as an adjective. So um, I'll, I'll advise a bit more to trademark owners, to brand owners out there on how actually trademark should be used and we'll go through it but let's explore marks that are at rights now how many of you say this on, your, on a daily basis why don't you google to find out the marks in question why don't you google to find out that or why don't so how why don't you research or why don't you look google google it so the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines to use the Google search engine to about as a person on the World Wide Web. It has also, Google's also been included in the Oxford English Dictionary. And in WordSpy, the online service for new wording is taken as a verb to the word Google. So you have all these online sites, dictionaries and all, basically implying that Google is becoming generic. It's becoming a normal English word to describe an act of searching on the internet. So, are aware of how it's actually in the risk of losing its brand value. 
if this brand is not protected well and it becomes generic, can you use the word Google easy? So the longest is possible to not become generic. What do they do? They watch the market. They watch the marketplace and if there's anywhere where the trademark is used as a common word, they send warning letters to those people. Uh, and they have proper usage guidelines on their website as well. Let's look at what usage guidelines does Google have on their website. Right, so they have uh, and their do's. Can you see? Some of it is distinguish the trademark from surrounding text in some way. Capitalize the first letter. Italicize the and place the marks in quotes. Use a different type. Of, so the first part basically says differentiate the word Google in any text that you're using. Make sure it stands out. Capitalize, italize. So there's various ways. Use different fonts. Spell exactly as they are shown in the Google Trademarks list link. Use the trademark only as an adjective, never as a noun or verb, and never in a plural or possessive form. And use the generic term for the product following the trademark. For example, the Google search engine, Google search, Google web search. So you can see they are using it as an adjective in front of the product itself, which is the search engine. Use only Google approved art when using Google's logos. So, so these are the example of do's. Let's see the example of don'ts. Then they go. So don't the, the don'ts are quite vast and quite extensive. So I will not be going through all of them. Uh, but you can see how they actually on how to use their brand and how not to use their brand. The one that's relevant here is, um, for example, is there's one I realized. Um, don't incorporate Google brand features into your own product name, service names, trademarks. Display a Google brand feature in a manner that Google's sole opinion is misleading, unfair, defamatory. Uh, don't display Google brand feature in any manner that implies a relationship or relationship with the brand. Um, and they also say don't display Google brand feature as the most prominent element on your web page. Uh, there are parts where it says that don't use, okay, look at the second last one um, in the slide. Don't use Google trademarks in a way that suggests a common descriptive or generic meaning. So, and the last one says that don't use the registration R in countries where it's not been registered and that's unlawful. So it is very careful on how you're using tra the trademark Google. Um, they allow people to use it, but there are many conditions. So that brings us actually to a very, very interesting case. In 2017, in US, there was a federal court decision on whether Google, the word Google, the brand Google, is it generic or not? If it is found to be generic, all competitors can use the word Google. Google cannot stop any party from using the word Google as a brand. So they held, the court held that Google, the verb Google, may have become a synonym for internet searching, but that doesn't mean the company can't protect its name. So now, like based on everything I just presented earlier, this decision is extremely confusing because it just kind of contradicts what I just said. So let's explore why. And let's explore what is this case about. Why, does, why did anyone even haul Google to court in the US who registered hundreds of website names? Um, and the names were Google, Disney.com, Google, Obama.com, Google, a brand, or Google, a person. So the word Google was in the domain name itself. Google obviously had an issue with this. Um, if someone is using Google in the domain name, that's wrong because that's their brand. So Google had internet regulated domains. Uh, we don't want to go too much into that, but if there is a domain name that incorporates any of your brands, you can, if you have um, satisfied three criteria, you can have the domain names transferred back to your ownership, uh, having proven those three criteria. So they had this, they have obviously proven the criteria and had regulators transfer back the domain names to, their, to Google's uh, company. So the man, very upset, he sued and he argued that the word Google had become generic. So if it's generic, I should be allowed to use that word in my domain name or in any domain names. You cannot stop me from using that word. Um, so he brought a lot of evidence to show that that brand was actually being used as a verb. Um, and for example, you know, the earlier slides I had, which was Merriam-Webster defining it, WordSpy defining it, it entering into a dictionary. All of those are evidence. If the brand is being described uh, as a manner of how search is done in the internet, isn't that evidence enough that it is 
generic. So those kind of evidence were brought forward, including lyrics from the rapper T-Pain. And one of the lyrics, he actually sings out, Google my name. Uh, those were also adduced as evidence. So there was extensive amount of evidence showing that this is generic. It's being used as a verb. But the court decided otherwise. The court held that people still regard Google as a brand in its own right, even if its name is also used as a verb. So the relevant uh, excerpts from the judgment uh, has been produced in the slide. Um, and it says that if the relevant public primarily understands a mark as describing who a particular good or service is or where it comes from, then the mark is still valid. But if the relevant public primarily understands a mark as describing what the particular product or good and service is, then the mark becomes generic. So then it clarifies further in the following paragraph, because not a single competitor calls its search engine Google, and because members of the consuming public recognize and refer to different internet search engines, Elliot has not shown, Elliot's the guy who, who uh, took the suit, has not shown that there is no available substitute for the word Google as a generic term. So a lot of legal jargon, let's try to explain it. Earlier, we are talking about sellotape, escalator, and so on. The, those brands were the only words anyone producing an escalator, anyone producing a sellotape, were describing their product with. So in, in, in the context of uh, Google, the Yahoo search engine, Bing, uh, um, Ask, various other search engines that are available on the internet, were not, be, were not interchangeably used with the word Google. So for that basis, people when, you, when people refer to the word Google and they use Google as a verb as well, they're talking about doing a search on the Google search engine. So it was not interchangeable with other brands in the same product line or service line. I hope that's clear. And if it's not, please shoot as many questions as you can. Um, because this decision is actually very interesting. Uh, they say it's being used as a verb, but hey, it's the brand Google still is recognized as a brand owned by Google Incorporated in, in, in uh, LA. And for that basis, it's still a brand owned by Google. It's not generic. And so LA lost this case. Now, another example that we have is jacuzzi. How many of us think that jacuzzi is the word, a generic word for a whirlwind bathtub? or oh, home spa. I think in Malaysia, we use it quite regularly uh, to say that, hey, there's a jacuzzi in this hotel room. Uh, I've never heard anything else apart from a jacuzzi. No one says the word whirlwind bathtub. Um, so it's interesting. Jacuzzi is a brand, and they've also gone all out to educate the public that, hey, it's a trademark. It's not a verb. It's not a noun. Let's look at their trademark guidelines on their website. So same thing, they, they say trademarks are adjectives. Trademarks shouldn't be used as a noun. Um, so their example is trademarks are adjectives intended to identify a particular company or group of related companies as a source of origin of a product. You can view our, so example given is you can view our entire line of jacuzzi whirlpool baths at our website, jacuzzi.com. So can you see it's not an entire line of jacuzzi Bots or jacuzzi at our website is jacuzzi whirlpool bots. So the word that they prefer the public to refer to the product is whirlpool bots, not jacuzzi because jacuzzi is the brand. So that's when when you say jacuzzi whirlpool bots, you're using jacuzzi as an adjective. So then they go on to say that trademarks should not be used without an associated generic product name because trademarks are adjectives that identify the source of origin of the product, they should always be used together with the correct generic product name. So incorrect is let's sit in the jacuzzi, or we know you will enjoy your jacuzzi. Correct is let's sit in the jacuzzi luxury pot, and we know you will enjoy your jacuzzi hot tub. So this is where it's very important to educate the public, educate your consumers on how to use your brand. People are lazy. <laughs> Putting it easily is saying that people are very lazy. Do would you say jacuzzi luxury bath and jacuzzi whirl whirlwind whirlpool baths? It's a mouthful. Why say that when people immediately know what you mean when you say, "Hey, this room has a jacuzzi"? 
So that's why people actually end up using the, the very famous brand for that product as a noun and not as an adjective. Okay, but that's the human nature. So you, as a brand owner, you're fighting against human nature of, of simplifying things. And you have to keep on educating, not just the public, everyone along your, your business, which is your sales team, your um, distributors, any associated partners who are promoting the product. Because how they represent the brand to the public is how the public then picks up, okay, this is how it should be used. So uh, there's a few, few more to this. Uh, it should not be used as a verb. It should not be used as a possessive form and um, it should um, how to refer to more than one trademark product. So you don't use jacuzzis. You use they use um, the, the plural they use is luxury baths and jacuzzi is never made into a plural. That brings us to the next case, which is Zumba. So Zumba also has an extensive trademark guideline. They are also used very vastly as um, uh, a verb as opposed to a brand and explaining what Zumba is. And again, it becomes because they're one of the quick ones in the marketplace that um, might not be the pioneer, but definitely one of the most famous ones in terms of um, Arabic exercises, dance-related Arabic fitness programs and exercises. So they became very famous. And when it's famous, people refer to it, hey, are you going to Zumba class? Do you, uh, do you take Zumba? So it becomes easy for that brand also to be on the gray line, on the borderline of becoming generic. So they've explained it here. You know, if you look at it, your first paragraph, I like how they've done it in their website. Uh, they say the Zumba trademarks are important business assets of Zumba fitness and should be treated with a high level of care. People around the world, including us, rely on our trademarks to identify our products and services and to distinguish them from those of our competitors. As creators and global leaders in dance, fitness programs, fitness equipment, footwear, and so on, we take great pride in our products and services and we relentlessly work to improve them. And then the second paragraph, if you can see that, if our trademarks become generic in a particular area, they would cease to identify our company as the exclusive source of products and services on which they appear. Accordingly, anyone would be able to use our marks without concern of a trademark infringement claim creating confusion in the marketplace. So they've justified why is trademark usage so important. Basically back to the whole part of, you know, it gives you exclusive rights and with exclusive rights, you get to exploit these rights. But if they lose these exclusive rights, they don't get to exploit it. They cannot license their brand to any party around the world because they have nothing to license. That brand is free for everyone to use to describe what fitness programs and what fitness classes they are providing. So then they go quite extensively to explain how to use their brand um, and then on how to actually differentiate the brand. So here they say, always use a trademark notice, always use the Zumba trademarks distinctively, then um, related to what we were talking about previously. Um, never look at number five, never use the Zumba trademarks as nouns or verbs. And you know, something that you can notice as well is every time the word Zumba appears, do you see they, they've put a symbol R with a circle around it? So they are differentiating that text because in terms of font, the word Zumba appears in a normal, simple font, same font as the whole sentence. So if they don't put the R or if you don't have it registered, if you don't put a TM symbol at the top right hand corner of your brand, it looks like any other word. So you're not helping your situation either if you don't actually differentiate it in the sentence that you're producing your brand. So number five, never use the Zumba trademarks on noun and verbs. Uh, number six, never use the Zumba trademarks as trade or company names. Um, and so on. And, and the bottom as well, okay, number nine, in summary, the Zumba trademark should never be used in the following ways. With the capital Z not capitalized, meaning it must always be capitalized. Then they give examples. Uh, in the altered or modified manner, as a verb, so don't use it as a verb. They said, once you Zumba, you'll be hooked. That's the example of, please don't use this in this manner. As a noun, for example, Zumba is my favorite exercise. So they're saying, don't use that as a trade name, on merchandise, and so on. That brings us to another WhatsApp. What's, how many of us say, hey, just WhatsApp me? We used to say, send me a message, which used to be through SMS, which is short, what does SMS stand for? Short messaging system, I think. 
Um, so yes, we say, please send me an SMS. But now we've gone, just send it to me on WhatsApp or WhatsApp me. Uh, and WhatsApp also has taken precautions and has, again, their own guidelines as well on how to use their brand. So you can see all the big brands are actually fearsome of their brand becoming generic. So bringing this to, to a summary is, if the trademark becomes a noun, it will be considered generic. And the mark then belongs in the public domain. When it appears in the public domain, competitors can use the brand lawfully. So the owner of the brand or the initial owner of the brand cannot prevent someone on riding on the goodwill and reputation that they have built. The owner no longer has exclusive rights, despite the fact that they have first or the pioneer in the marketplace to put their product or services in the marketplace, but they're unable to stop any copycats from using its trademark. The escalator, for instance, can you imagine if Otis Elevator still owned that trademark escalator? It's a big difference. It's a brand that everyone recognizes. Everyone knows that it's, it's the pioneer in the marketplace. Uh, and with brand recognition, people, if you're choosing, if any mall developers or any property developers are thinking of what product to use, what branded product to use for their escalators, which one has the best safety mechanism, which one is reliable and doesn't break down often, all of that, the first thing you do is get a quotation from Escalator or the Otis Elevator company because that's the brand that you recognize the most. So when it's a very famous brand, there's so much of goodwill and reputation that the owner then loses when there's all of this, when the mark becomes generic. The hard work and heavy marketing is all gone to waste. There's a decline in brand value. So when there's a sale of a company, the brand is no longer valued. And most companies these days, I mentioned earlier, it's a knowledge-based economy. In the knowledge-based economy, the brand value is so important. Uh, we always say this, okay, touch wood, but if Coca-Cola's factories around the world, for some reason, are destroyed, fire or any other unfortunate incident, the brand value, the value of the company is in two things, the brand itself and the ingredients, which they've kept top secret. That's a trade secret. So they can rebuild it because the physical this destruction of the, the factories would not affect the brand value and the fact that they still have the trade secret. So it's very important in terms of maintaining the brand value in any business that you're building. That's what you're doing every year in, year out, you're building a brand. Um, so taking care of that is important. Market share will be reduced as the brand is then freely used by competitors. So I also mentioned earlier, competitors are the people who will be extremely happy that a brand in their field of industry is becoming generic because then they can use it to describe your products. And when you describe, you, you describe your products or your services with another brand, the only reason you do it is because people don't recognize your brand. So people don't know what you do and they don't know how good it is. So when a, gen a famous brand becomes generic, it helps competitors because it immediately raises their recognition in the marketplace. Um, for example, uh, back to my Velcro example, if you're selling those fasteners, Velcro type fasteners. How do you tell people that I'm selling Velcro type fasteners? Because the word fasteners is not people, there's so many type of fasteners. So people won't immediately know that, oh, it's as good as Velcro fasteners. So that example is why people, competitors especially, love for brands in their field to go generic. So moving forward, what should you as your brand, as a brand owner do? Or if you are working with clients with brands, what should you advise them to do? Use their brands with care. Ensure that your clients or you, if you yourself own your own brands, ensure that you use your brands with care. And observe how everyone else in, in the distribution line are using the brand. So this is your, your own customers, your suppliers, your distributors, franchisees your sales team, your internal marketing team, any person that's related in creating that product or service, affixing that brand onto the product or service and putting it out in the marketplace. That whole chain of supply, they need to be educated on how the brand is meant to be used. They ensure there's proper usage. And this takes a lot of monitoring, a lot of education uh, internally and externally. And when, when you find it isn't right, set it right. 
So remember earlier we we're talking about the Google lawyers. The Google lawyers um, send cease and desist letters to anyone who's not using it right. This then educates people on how to use their brand correctly. Also, and we've gone, as you've seen in all the the usage guidelines adduced by WhatsApp, by uh, Zumba, and so on on your website, use the brand as an adjective, not as a noun, not as a verb. So, for example, bring me a cup of Nescafe coffee and as opposed to bring me a Nescafe. Similarly, though this example is actually probably will not be understood by Generation Y, um, I love my Walkman music player and not I love my Walkman. Yeah. So, so Walkman also, again, okay, so this example, Walkman was the pioneer to bring music to us while we can move. Basically, a mobile music player. That's how it started, the history of music inventions in the music industry. We could walk about and still have music. And so Walkman was the first player, for the first uh, music player that, make, that you could actually take with you anywhere. And that was why it also was in the risk of being generic. So this example on how you should actually say it, as opposed to just saying, I love my Walkman. Differentiate the mark from other texts. So secondly, the trademark, if used in a sentence, can be highlighted in a different font, different color, for instance, to show it's a brand. So you can use the R symbol or the TM symbol, capitalize it, um, change the fonts. Again, these are examples that we've already spoke about. Um, and these are local examples. My wife uses Baba's curry powder or please buy three cases of Spitzer drinking water. So the, number one, they use it as an adjective, not as a noun. Number two, they've capitalized it or made it look different from the other part of the text. So you're showing to people that this is a brand. And do not use the brand, the mark as a verb. So example would be, you should say, please photocopy two copies of this letter and not please Xerox two copies of this letter for me. Or do not forget to vacuum the carpet as opposed to do not forget to hoover the carpet. Okay, so um, a bit more, as you become more famous, as the brand business evolves and the brand becomes bigger and more developed and changes with time, the trademark evolves as well. So these are very important, apart from, it goes in line with monitoring the manner of usage of your brand. These are examples of brands that have evolved over time. So they become famous, but Again, it's not just about being famous and taking care of the manner of usage or the way it's used, whether it's a noun or a verb or adjective. It's very important to also change the brand in line of customers' interests um, and how it's perceived in the marketplace. So Coca -Cola, Pepsi Cola here um, has evolved over the years. See how it first started? I bet many of you are thinking how it's very similar to another brand out there in the marketplace. And yes, it is very similar. Let's not name names <laughs> as to what it looks like. But can you see how it's very different now? It's also very modern now in the day-to-day. -day. But it's, it's evolved. It wasn't an overnight thing. The, con the brand hasn't changed overnight, but it evolved over the many years. Uh, and this needs to be protected as well. And here, Shell also changed. So th these companies are large. So they would have done a lot of research, a lot of surveys, and a lot of branding exercise to change their brand in according to what the customers perceive it and how they want it to look in this modern day and age compared to 1900s. Another example provided. You can see that these three examples in the earlier days, about a century ago, they were all drawings um, and quite neat, quite, quite detailed. Uh, as you can see, the lion in Peugeot is very detailed in 1850. The shell, also very, I don't know about how detailed is it, this is and how artistic this is. Maybe the 1904 one is a bit more detailed. But you can see how it looks very natural in nature. And here as well, very artistic, 1898, the Pepsi-Cola. But then it comes to a clean cut in this day and age. Everything, 1999, look at Shell, look at Peugeot. So it's moved with times. So that's very important as well. As your brand becomes more established in the marketplace, make sure it's used properly. Make sure it's refreshed, refreshed to suit the public and your con consumers and get them protected as well, the latest versions of it. Okay, this comes to my last example is always know what's going on in the marketplace. New marks may appear and may or may be accidentally created. 
Do you know any new marks? I mean, what brands out there that were created by the public and not by the owner themselves? I hope you're exercising your brain juices because it'll be interesting. Uh, if this was an interactive session, you could I could ask questions. But brands can be created by us, you and me, who experience the product, who taste the product, who experience the services. And remember earlier I was saying that human it is human nature to be lazy so when we are lazy what do we do we give nicknames so the nickname that we've given coca-cola is coke coca-cola is a mouthful it's four syllables in fact um when we advise clients on how to choose a very good brand we tell them to stick to two or three syllables at most because it's human nature to shorten a lot of things and you want to take control of how people are saying your name, your brand. You want to take control of how the brand is used, what brand is used. You do not want your, the public creating brands for you. Coca-Cola example, for example, for example, take Coca-Cola for example. The word Coke was created by the public because it's just too long to say Coca-Cola. They use Coca-Cola as well, but Coke became very much popular when they're referring to Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola had to then protect that brand as well. And imagine the branding exercise in that, making sure the word Coca-Cola is protected in all over the world, and then making sure Coke is protected as well. So this is an interesting case of, of monitoring the marketplace, noticing what people are, are calling your brand, what nicknames they're using for their brand. Uh, and if you're starting a business from scratch, if you're a startup company, making sure you have a short brand. It's easy to remember, it's easy to recall. People will not make a nickname of a name that's already very short. Uh, and that actually brings us to the last case for the day is Coca-Cola and Overland. Very interesting case. And this was much way back in 1982 in the US. So there was this restaurant called Topaz Lodge and Casino, which was owned by Overland. And they used to sell only one type of cola drink, which is Pepsi Cola. But when customers asked for Coca-Cola or Coke, they were served Pepsi Cola without the waitresses informing customers that it's a substitution. That, hey, we don't have Coca-Cola, we don't have Coke, but would you like a Pepsi Cola? There was none of those made. When the Coca-Cola was requested or Coke was requested, a Pepsi Cola was placed right in front of the customer. So Coca-Cola, which has a team that investigates all of this because this is nothing new, it happens in the marketplace, sued Overland for this misrepresentation. They sued on the basis of trademark infringement and unfair competition. They had evidence to show that out of 29 separate occasions over a three-year period, 23 times on those 29 occasions, employees of the restaurant substituted without comment Pepsi-Cola in response to specific orders for Coca-Cola or Coke. Evidence is very important in any legal dispute. Everyone knows that by now including trademark disputes. So this was their evidence. They did research before actually taking any suit. And um, Topaz, the restaurant, or Overland, who owns the restaurant, argued that the trademark Coke has become generic to all cola beverages. And then there was a lot of uh, evidence being submitted on how Coke is used generically. And, and Coca-Cola as well submitted a lot of evidence to show, no, it's not generic. It's actually a brand. And people recognize it as a brand. The court was in favor of Coca-Cola's evidence. The evidence was extensive. They've, they've actually argued this case in many other places to say that Coke's not generic and there was infringement where other people used Coke as a trademark uh, when it wasn't an original Coca-Cola product. So the court found that it was an act of infringement by Overland and they found that the brand Coke was not generic. So that case actually highlights um, what the other case as well highlighted in terms of um, brands which are generic, they can be destroyed. Famous brands can be destroyed for being generic, but there needs to be sufficient evidence to show that people don't recognize that word as a brand anymore. And that brings me to the conclusion of this webinar today. I would love to address any questions that you have, either as brand owners or consultants who advise brand owners. Please go ahead um, to raise questions. And thank you very much for, for listening in and tuning in and taking your Thursday morning. Yes, Ivana. Hi. Yeah. Hi.
Hi. Yes, Gita. Very good. Yes, Gita. Very good. Thank you. I, hear the echo. I hope everyone yeah. benefited from it. Yeah, and then maybe I can turn on your webcam. Sure. Right, can you see me? Okay, good. Yeah, good. So, um, thanks for your sharing. And then Rohani did a comment. Rohani commented that never knew Zumba is trademarked. It is quite oh, common to have wow. Zumba classes. <laughs> yeah. I also didn't know. That's exactly what Zumba does not want to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah, la, but it's like so common. It's like, yeah. Right, Zumba. Let's Zumba. I like Zumba. Yeah. So, I, but I noticed the Zumba, there's an R there. So, I did, uh, uh, like, I was like thinking, hey, how come Zumba got R? You know? Then now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So okay, thank you. So yeah, now is the Q and A session. Hmm? Um, is there any question from the online audience? But how come I hear the got what? Got echo? Ah. Can you hear some echo it's for those online? Wait, I just want to check myself first. But you don't hear echo on your side, right? Hmm. On my end, is Wait, it? Ah. No. Ah. No, it's the echo is from my side. I can hear my own echo. So I just want to ask. Testing, testing. Hmm. Okay. No. Maybe it's only my computer. Never mind. No echo. Good. So I know. Uh, Husna said no. So I will read uh, everyone's name. And then if you have a question, you just type in the chat box. If you have no question, uh, type zero. Type zero if you have no question. So Amanda, if, if you have any question? Carmen Ho, any question? Ho Hui Kin, any question? Kumara, any question? Yen, any question? Oh, yeah. So there's a question by uh, Ali. So I uh, uh, broadcast her question. Okay, Ali's question. Can you see the question, Gita? Okay, Ali's. so he says, uh, Good morning, Gita. Taking into the case of Google, what if someone started another search engine but called it Googs, for example? A Googs search engine. We simplify things. Would that be in any infringement? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a very good question. So thank you, Ali. Um, and so with, with trademarks, um, tr infringement and passing off, you compare the brands, uh, but not just the brands. You actually compare what industry are they using it in. So his question is, you're comparing Google with Googs, but in the same industry. It's both search, search engine. Um, it's, the, the law provides that if it's substantially similar, and like, there's likelihood of confusion, there's a case for Google against the person that's using the abbreviated version, Googs. Uh, so here, it would be a question of, is there confusion? Is it substantially similar? And with substantially similar, you'll be comparing it in three manners. You'll be comparing it visually, orally, and conceptually. So Google and Googs, there's no meaning. So there's no conceptual comparison here. Whereas visually, a large chunk of the word Google has been used in the second mark. Googs and Google, you've only taken out L and E. Then uh, in terms of uh, auditory, so listening to it, um, it's Google and Googs. Again, the first part, your first prefix has been used. Uh, so it's actually a high chance for Google to have a good case against Googs. It's the same industry. Orally and visually, it's very similar. And there might be likelihood of confusion because there are not many search engines around. There's a handful of search engines that many people use. So uh, to, to Ali, the question is, would there be any infringements? Okay, so that's a, also a very good question. There wouldn't be infringement. Infringement is, I have registered rights and that person's trespassing my rights. Uh, here, it might be passing off because there's no, it's not um, identical misuse. There's not an identical misuse. Um, and there is, and there's kind of like a, um, uh, uh, misrepresentation that these parties are related. So the, you'll go under passing off. The only infringement would be infringement is if there's proper misuse in terms of this is my trademark, you're trespassing my rights. So this is not similar, this is not identical marks. So you're going on the basis of passing off. You're passing off as if I am related to Google or I've got permission from Google to use a shortened version of the name. So yeah, it's 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 uh, overload of information maybe, but so it, it, it is a basis for Google to take an action. That's, that's the conclusion to that question. 
Okay, thank you. So basically, is uh, Google don't want you to write on their brand because they have spent so much time and effort to build that brand. Then you just tweak a bit, tweak yeah. a bit, then it's right. That, that's the whole fundamental of it. Uh. Yeah, right. so trademark law protects two parties. Trademark law is you and me, Ivana, and everyone out there, the public. We need to know and be very certain when you buy a product or you use a service that you're using the service which is genuine. And that's what brands are about. You know the source of origin of the product or the service. When you take a Coca-Cola, you want to know you're drinking Coca-Cola. It's not some other company uh, that you don't trust. It's all about trust. So it protects the people. So it protects public. And for that reason, public should not have two brands which are very similar because it confuses us. Especially if the brand is something we consume. Because then you're going to be taking medication and it's dangerous. You're going to be applying skincare products that is dangerous on your skin. So you can't take something that you don't trust. And you, two brands that coexist that are very similar is dangerous for people. Second party that it protects is the trademark owners, which is what you just said. You build all this brand, you, there's so much of reputation and goodwill and tries to ride on your reputation and goodwill when they've done nothing at all. There's, there's zilch effort in educating people that this is a brand. And then they come and try to ride on your goodwill. And that's what people do. That's what newcomers do. They say uh, mm. imitation is the best form of flattery, right? Uh, yeah. uh, none of the brand owners like that whole saying because no, imitation is not a form of flattery. Go build your own brand. Stop stealing my market share. So there's two parties yeah. that you're protecting. So the law tries to balance the interests of two parties. Yeah, yeah. So actually I passed by uh, SS2 and I saw KFC. I saw then it become Kampong Fried Chicken, something like that. But it's like suddenly it's so KFC, ma, right? And then SS2 KFC closed down, you know, so you're like, huh? new KFC or no, it's a kampong fried chicken, not, not KFC. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. And then I think people, yeah, like newcomers, lo, easy, easy for them to just tweak a bit here and then. Okay, so uh, Steve, mm. you said Zumba. Zumba has been used rampantly here at Clang Valley as a verb and as generic words. Did Zumba owner worldwide gotten cast or Zumba lawyer to send out <laughs> legal letter? <laughs> so, so, no, well, yeah. they haven't we asked cast to send any legal letter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which I should approach them, right? Um, it's, okay, so it, it needs to be enforced. Whether they have sent legal letters, we're not certain. Um, it really becomes, it's, it's same thing with counterfeit goods. It's important for them to enforce, but it's a question of where do they enforce? What resources do they have to enforce in every single country, in every small little district? So uh, I, I'm sure there's a system in place to enforce, but they'll target the big guys first. So companies are opening a lot of franchises and using Zumba without a license. You're looking at stuff like that. Um, enforcing worldwide is ideal, but not all companies have the resources to do that. I've spoken to Disney in-house counsel, for example, and for them, they have a team that does digital monitoring, which means yeah. they do online monitoring whether the brands are used correctly and whether there's in online infringement. And they have on-ground infringement, on-ground whether people are selling products that are infringing. And then they don't take action against everyone because they just don't have the resources. They still have a business to run. If, if all their resources are being used in enforcing, then it also defeats the purpose in having the business. So back to your question, Steve, you, which is a good question. Uh, they should send letters, but I, I think it's a matter of, is that business big enough? Are they actually um, stealing market share that it would be theirs? Um, then they would actually enforce. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. So maybe they can employ those uh, Zumba lover. If you manage to spot anyone misrepresenting our Zumba... We pay for your Zumba class. <laughs> Send a spy. Actually, no, I'm the, the, the other reason, uh, Ivana and Steve, actually, the other reason brand owners would want to protect their brand and enforce it in a specific jurisdiction is in the interest of licensees and franchisees. Licensees yeah. and franchisees do not pay a license fee if they find a lot of people who are using the brand without paying a license fee. It's like, what, what, wait, what's going on? Why am I even paying a license fee? I'm paying a license fee for your brand, but you're not taking action against all these other people who are using your brand Zumba. So that then becomes an issue with Zumba when they find out. So these kind of cases might be a situation where they don't find out or they don't know yet. Uh, because anyone who wants to run a Zumba class in Malaysia would need a license from Zumba. Okay, okay. Yeah, right. So, thank you, thank you. So, uh, is there any question? I continue reading the name. Uh. So, Steve and... Yeah, uh, sure. 
Steve and Ali, can you let us know whether Gita answer your question? Okay, so I'll read out the name. If you have no more question, type zero. If you still have question, then you type your question or type one. Then we'll wait for you, okay? So just now I stop at uh, Faizin. Any question? Type one if you have question. Type zero if no question. Uh. Catherine, Esther, any question? Rohani, Jeffrey, uh, Young, Roger, Amir, Espitan. Uh, Espitan say no. Okay, good. And then Vijay, Kelly, Wilfred, Suhada, Glazer, Mandy Kong, uh, CY, Husna, Sharin, Alisa, Mimi, Susanna, Sharon, Lee, and Angelina. Okay, that's all. So, no more question. So, okay. But Steve, I think, also said something. Wait, huh? uh, okay, Steve said, you shared that Google lawyers sent many legal letters. Did they actually proceed to prosecute the big cases? Yeah, Steve. Uh, very good question, actually. Um, uh, so, the, to that extent, I am not sure. They might have. The, Google has a lot of disputes. They're, most of the disputes are more patent related, actually, because they have a lot of patents. Uh, I'm not sure, actually, whether it's gone to this situation where they will prosecute, prosecute it, because um, the most famous one that was prosecuted was the one I discussed, the one where um, uh, there was an individual who registered domain names. And when they sent legal letters and he ignored it, and then after that, when they had it transferred, he was upset. So that was the, the most famous case in terms of Google stopping someone from using their name as a generic word. There hasn't been any other cases, but it might have been. It's all a matter of whether has it been reported, and I didn't come across any. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Steve, did Gita answer your question? So next is Jeffrey. Hi, Gita. Would you explain about OEM products from the brand manufacturers? What are any trademark required to protect OEM rights? All right. So thanks, Jeffy, for your question. Uh, in terms of uh, OEM rights, you're looking at your contract manufacturing agreement. Your contract manufacturing agreement has to have all the rights that protects your needs. Um, for the, as if you're a brand owner, um, getting it manufactured with an OEM company, either locally or in China or Vietnam, which are now the cost um, efficient places to have it manufactured, then as the brand owner, you must make sure that there's no overruns or the overruns are reported to you and the brand is used um, correctly when they are affixing the brand onto the products. So in your license, you'll be giving a license to the manufacturer, just a license to manufacture and affix the brands. Be a very limited license uh, and very strict penalties if they breach that license. So if you're the brand owner, you're looking in terms of how is your manufacturer going to use your brand? What happens to overrun products or over manufactured products? More numbers than actually the ones you ordered. That's important. If you are the manufacturer yourself, then making sure that your rights are protected. Um, and most of the time, these are payment terms, delivery, not so much in terms of brands because you are the manufacturer itself. If you are the manufacturer, then my advice is, and I think most OEM manufacturers do this, is the, the, the bread and butter in the business is doing OEM for other companies, but they will slowly start to build their own brand because the, the brand value is you build your own brand. You then have uh, added margin that you can sell when you put a product into the marketplace. So uh, manufacturers normally do that. So that's my advice if you're on a manufacturer line, manufacturing line. I hope that addresses your question, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, Jeffrey, let us know, okay? Uh, whether Gita answer your question or you have further question, you can post here also. So next is Steve again. He's very interested about those uh, I sue you, you sue me kind of thing. About Disney's trademark protection team, any big cases prosecuted in Asia Pacific? Yeah, I just want to know the, all the case law and all these big cases. About Disney. Disney's trademark protection, any big cases prosecuted, prosecuted in Asia Pacific? Uh, we'll have to get back to you. We can definitely research this. Yeah. Uh, in I, I'm sure there are cases in China, especially. Uh, a lot of big brands oh. have a lot of problems in China. Uh, this is a definite. Steve, I think there's definitely big cases prosecuted because Asia Pacific is a huge market to all these brands. Uh, everyone has entered and are entering Asia Pacific, but I, I don't have the information uh, before me right now. So I can get back to you. Maybe, Steve, you can give us your email address and we can drop you an email. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or maybe you can do a webinar and then can do the like case study kind of thing zoom into the case <laughs> if there is uh, if you yeah, have yeah, resources to do it, 
Yeah. yeah, we've done cases in China. I think we've talked about taking a brand to China. We did some case studies in China yeah. the last time we had a webinar, right? Yeah, yeah, Sing Parker yeah. and uh, Starbucks. Wow, you remember? <laughs> clap, clap, clap. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, got <Lisa. laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so I think this is interesting, lah. And then, um, uh, wait, ah, uh, got people singing birthday song. So, okay. Ah, uh, so okay. Ah, uh, Kumara. Hey, wait, Steve, you. Thanks for your answer on Google. Those people singing the birthday song, I think they finished Zumba class because I'm in a cafe. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear you though. We can't hear the birthday song. They are there. <laughs> Ivana, you're quite funny. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you. Then after that, next is uh, Steve, you said thanks for your answer on Google. Okay, good. So next, Kumara. Okay, Kumara, ask a question. What should a company budget to trademark a brand name, basically? Is there a figure to allocate to ensure proper compliance? Yeah, so like people budget, um, you know, company budget um, some for marketing, Right, for a lot of things, but uh, I don't think people budget less, but put some budget for trademark, right? That would, that would be all. So, so, so uh, it, depends, on it? it depends on uh, what market. Uh, if you're looking at Southeast Asian market, market is not, it's not very expensive because you're looking at payment in the, in the same currency. Malaysia, for example, it ranges between 2000 to 2500 ringgit for a trademark to be protected um, using a service provider. Then in Singapore, it's usually around the same price in their currency. So you're looking at 2,000 or 1,500, 2,000 Singapore dollars. Then in Indonesia, you're looking around, I think it's also around 2,500, 3,000 ringgit. So it dep depends on which country. Uh, and the budget, so the budgeting comes to which jurisdictions do you want to protect the brand in? And when you decide which jurisdiction, jurisdictions you want to protect the brand in, it then comes to a question of where is your market share? You don't want to protect in everywhere around the world when you don't have a market share. So what are your interested markets that you're entering into? Then you'll have someone budgeting it for you. It really depends on country by country basis. So trademark rights are territorial in nature, uh, which means that you protect it in the country that you're going to specifically. There are regional rights. So Europe, you can file one trademark. Uh, it's a community trademark and it covers 28 countries, excluding UK because UK has left the EU. Um, what's the second question? So is there a figure to allocate to ensure proper compliance? Uh, for this, so what normally happens uh, in practice is that the marketing team, any company's marketing team, they are monitoring what competitors are doing. They are monitoring how consumers are responding to their brand or any marketing campaign. So the marketing team naturally becomes a monitoring company, not company, monitoring party, a monitoring group. Because you're out there, you're marketing, you're putting the product out there, you also know what consumers are saying about your product. So the proper compliance ends up being an internal measure, internal education to your team to look out how is it, how, our brand being perceived, how is it being used in the marketplace. Of course, the bigger the companies are, like Coca-Cola, for instance, are also checking on other companies on what are they saying, what are they selling, are they using the word Coca-Cola, and that's how the whole case came about in 1982. So bigger companies will have a team actually doing proper compliance and will have resources for that. I hope that explains your question, okay. Kumara. Yeah, so for basic cost, let's say a basic one, uh, just started. Uh, let's say you have uh, presence in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Indonesia and Vietnam, right? So maybe Malaysia, how much should they budget? Let's say uh, they just started and then they don't have much resources, but they want to protect roughly. Wait, just give me a second. Uh, Ivana, Steve has given his email address. Let me just uh, jot it down. Oh, yeah. Oh, you have it. Okay, okay. okay we have it. Okay. Okay, yeah. say that again. What should the company... Oh, yeah, the there... trademark, right, about the budget. So maybe give us some um, uh, online audience. Uh, they want to advise their clients, right? Then the clients will ask them, how much do I need to pay? You know, I just started out. I'm not like Coca-Cola, big resources. So uh, as a start, let's say in Malaysia, how much is it? Indonesia, how much? Vietnam, how much? Singapore, how much? Roughly. Oh, I think Ivana, you, you want to missed it. I, I, said just now, I said just now. Oh, you yeah. mentioned just now. Yeah, mm, I mentioned just now. Sorry. So someone, <laughs> someone 2000, uh, to 2,500 for, for Malaysia. For Indonesia, I think you're looking at around 3,000 ringgit. Uh, Singapore, you're yeah. looking at around one five to 2,000 Singapore dollars. So, um, okay. yeah, I mean, we can give specific breakdowns. Anyone's interested, just drop us an email, uh, specific breakdowns, what's yeah. professional fees, what's, what's the government fees, what disbursements and so on can be provided. But these kind of um, 
costing like like what I just said is not expensive considering you have protection for ten years. You only renew your brand every ten years. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. So sorry. Welcome. Ah. Uh, yeah. So Kumara said Disney is a uh, trademark. It's trademark. Okay. Would Disney be an issue? Oh, instead of D S uh, D I S N E Y become wow. Well, try to be interest funny. Yeah. D I S N E E. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it will be an issue. So this is like similar to the Google question, Google and Googs. Uh, this is more similar to Disney than Googs is to Google. So uh, the question is, so it's always about yeah, would this Disney will be an issue if it's used on the same products, same type of uh, services. So if it's going to be a production company producing cartoons, or you're going to be using cartoon characters and you're calling it Disney. Uh, so it really depends on what is the brand being used on. You don't have ownership for everything under the sun. So Disney can't claim their brand for everything under the sun. Um, mm. Having said that, it's a famous brand. So famous brands can claim almost everything under the sun. Because if it's famous, you have rights not on just identical or substantially similar products and goods, products and services, but you also have rights on everything that's not similar. Which means if someone opens a restaurant and calls themselves Disney. Disney may have a chance to can to to stop their restaurant from operating, so it's it's well known brands have more rights. Uh, it's all a fact case to case basis, uh, but if it's an unknown brand, then um, having Disney and Disney with a different spelling, but for different products and different services, can may be allowed. Oh, so I hope that okay, also yeah. addresses. Everyone's got very interesting questions today. Yeah, so the restaurant open instead of Disney become Disney, but the eye put very small. Cannot see them when Disney sue them. No, no, no. Is it Disney? Do you see the eye so small? <laughs> and we are selling ayam rendang, non crispy. <laughs> this is like the Mac Mac okay. Curry and McDonald case, right? Because the yeah. Mac Curry, the Mac Curry guy was saying that M and C stands for Malaysian chicken yeah. curry. Ah, uh, yeah. So it's not Mac. Yeah, it's they try Malaysian to argue, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, try to wiggle your way out. So, okay, good. Um, Steve, you said thanks for your answer on Disney AP. I know that Disney TM has been badly used in China and also Southeast Asia. Hence my question. So, my email. Okay, so okay, lah. So, this one you jot down his email already. Right? Okay. Steve, you. Yeah, sure. We'll email him. So, good. Is there any further question from the uh, online audience? So uh, if no, then um, just do take note that the, the next webinar is, let me see. I think taking uh, the brand global. What issues do you face when you take the brand global? Yeah, it's by your colleague, right? Yeah, by your colleague. So yeah, I haven't posted it. Yeah, Amir, right? So I haven't posted it up in the event. So do I will email everyone once the event page is being updated. If not, then you can check back the Facebook event page for any uh, future webinar by cast because they have actually we have actually um, scheduled a few uh, webinar all the way until year end. So you will hear a lot from Cass, and then I really thank you, uh, Cass, for putting the effort to share in my webinar so that everyone in Malaysia can benefit. Okay, so thank thanks, you, Gita. Thanks for the opportunity, Yana. Yeah, um, and it's always nice collaborating with you. Oh, mm -hmm. very nice. No, I said that just now you said this is not an interactive session. You can't post questions, but actually can. So you can always ask the audience question and then they will, you know, give get feedback from them. It's okay. It's okay one. I mean, yeah, in the no, future... I, I, think, I, think I, meant, uh, I think I meant during the... During the webinar, you know how you get interrupted when you're giving a talk, normally during the webinar. But yeah, you're right. Like our team has been very, very, very interactive. There yeah, very a good. lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. everyone. Thank, you, thank, yeah. you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks to the audience. Have a nice yep. day. Have a good week. Yeah. See you. See you again. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, Steve. Bye, Rohani. Bye, Kumara. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Jeffrey. Okay, bye.